Good morning, church. He is risen. You can be seated. Or you can stand. <laughs> Whichever you want. Uh, 19, uh, I don't even ask him if you were alive in 1979. 1979, the Jesus movie came out. But two great movies came out in 1979. Uh, one was Star Wars. The other was uh, a movie called Jesus. Um, which, I, I, if you ever saw the Jesus movie, it's just a pretty straightforward telling of the life of Jesus. It is phenomenal. I remember seeing it in theaters. The reason I remember seeing it was, one, because of the impact I had, and two, because of the date I had. You're like, how old were you? I was six years old and uh, went to see the Jesus film with a beautiful blonde. Here's how that went down, and then I'll tell you about the Jesus film. Uh, our church was doing a church trip to, the, uh, to see the Jesus film. My, uh, my, my dad was the pastor. Uh, there was a singles group. Beautiful young lady lady was there, and she immediately said, as they talked about who she was going to go with, she immediately said, David is my date. And so I just, went, I remember we went on the church bus, I walked in the theater like this next to her, right? But eventually, as I watched that film, what swept me away was the life of Jesus Christ itself portrayed on the screen the way I had never seen it before. And it perfectly depicts the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That film went on to move planet Earth, me meaning this, that it is one of the most seen films in all the world. The reason is missionaries use the Jesus film because it's just this straightforward telling. It's, it's, it's just honest to the facts of the gospel. They use it to go to unreached people groups. Paul Eichelman is, is in particular the head of the Jesus film project. And he tells stories about what happens when they go and they show the story of Jesus. He said, we, uh, he said they were in a refugee camp in uh, the southeast coast of Africa. He says, we're at this camp. We set up the, the screen at, at Back then, it's just this, this cloth screen. We've got a, an old film projector. He says, we start showing this. And these people, for the first time, they see Jesus. And you know, when you see Jesus, you just begin to fall in love with him. You hear his teaching, and something in your heart says, that is right. And the Holy Spirit stirs you. And, and they watch him do miracles. They see him touch the leper. They see him raise the dead. And as they watch this, these people are falling in love with Jesus. And then... They see him taken and they see him beat. And Eichelman says the crowd goes absolutely quiet. They've never seen this. And then they see him taken and crucified. And Eichelman says people begin to weep. All of a sudden, he says, you could feel the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. And people fall down and they start weeping. But then something else happened. After they're weeping, as Jesus is lifted up on the cross, they're so swept away by the story, they begin running toward the screen. Dust is kicked up into the air, and the film projector has to be shut off because they can't show the rest of the film. And all of a sudden, Eichmann says, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, people are down, and they're confessing sins, and they're broken before the cross of Christ. He said, we sent counselors down into the crowd to try and tell them that this isn't the entire story. But he said, every time we sent counselors down into the, the crowd, the Holy Holy Spirit would sweep over the counselors and they began to confess their sins. And he said there was just this moving of God in that place as people lay broken, crying, hurting over the death of Jesus Christ. Then he says, finally, after about 30 minutes, it got, it got still enough that the dirt had gone out of the air, that the, that the place had kind of quieted. He said, finally, we turned the projector on. And that crowd saw Jesus Christ crucified now raised to life. And what do you think happened? When they saw Jesus suddenly come on that screen, and the, now listen, they didn't know the story. These are unreached people groups. What do you think happens when you, because you guys know the story. I'm like, it's not going to surprise you if I tell you Jesus died, because you immediately go, yeah, but he rose again. But imagine you didn't know that. Suddenly they see on the screen the risen Jesus, and it's not just applauding. They start jumping up and down. They start celebrating. They start screaming. There is absolute joy. Let me ask you this. Do you remember when that was you? Do you remember when that kind of joy of salvation just kind of burst from them? The story was new, and it was, it was fresh, and it was phenomenal. 
I want to just start a series today, and I just want you to come every, well, I just actually want you to come forever to church, but, but I want you to come every week uh, coming up, and we're just going to talk about rebuilding your faith. Because for some of you, you came to faith, there was authentic joy. There was happiness and there was excitement. But for some, over time, your faith has been really battle damaged. It's been scarred. It's become ragged, like an old sofa sat on and sat on and sat on. And eventually just kind of pushed out to the street. And this is just a season that I have felt God saying, hey... I just want for you to call people to re-examine, re-examine what it is they believe, to think more deeply about spiritual things. So today I want to start out just talking about concrete faith. What, why, why is it we believe what we believe and how solid is the faith in Jesus Christ? Or if I can put it this way, can I know that what I believe is true or do I just, I don't know, I just believe it. Ask some people, why do you believe what you believe? I just believe it. Leave me alone. Well, well, that's it? Yeah, I just, I just choose to believe. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Now faith is the assurance of the things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Jesus said it this way. The wise man, what did the wise man build? He built on something that is concrete. A foolish man goes and he builds on sand. And when the storm comes, his entire house falls down. But the wise man built on the rock so that when the storm came, listen, life storms are coming and life storms are not just debt. They're not just external. They're not just problems. There's also the inner storms that are going to come your way. Sometimes you're going to doubt the faith. Sometimes you're going to wonder, why do I believe what I believe? Sometimes the storm isn't out there. Sometimes the storm is in here. And if you have not built your faith on a rock, when that storm comes from within, from in here, the house built on sand will fall down but the house that's built on the rock will withstand that storm it will remain strong because let, let's just kind of admit this what we believe in christianity is slightly grandiose am i right it's big it's not like a call to hey come meditate with us this is not a call to the universe being one or look the claims of Christianity are huge. The claim is this, that we live in a created world. That all that we see was made by the hands of a maker. And yet something incredibly tragic happened that we sinned. And evil is not just a concept that's out there, but that there's real evil in our world. And that we have a God who looks down at us as evil seeks to clutch us and destroy us. And we have given ourselves over to that evil. And because we are sinners, we are destined to death unless somebody rescues us. And the message of the Bible is this. Over and over and over, we have a God who rescues us. And so whether it is Noah or it is Moses, we've got a God who comes down and he rescues Noah. He comes down and he rescues Moses. We've got a God who rescues Elijah over and over until finally God says, look, I'm not just going to kind of rescue them afar. I'm going to get down there and personally rescue them. And that's the gospel. The gospel is not that God sent someone to rescue you. The gospel is God rescued you. That he came and he died on that cross. That's a grandiose claim, isn't it? That what happened 2,000 years ago has effects on you. And then the claim is this. That though murdered on that cross, he did not stay dead. He rose again. That's incredible love. In, in, in The Princess Bride, wasn't it? He says, true love, or death can't stop true love. Come on, you guys quote The Princess Bride all the time. Stop it. See, there's all, I, I ought to just let you yell out your favorite line, but I'm not going to. But you should stop rhyming. Uh, death can't stop true love. That's not The Princess Bride, that's the gospel. That the Son of God rose again. That is this, that though you may think you're good enough, you are not good enough, nor are you strong enough to conquer death. So God himself, who is good enough and strong enough, himself came down and conquered death. So why do you believe that? Let me ask you that. Why do you believe what you believe? Let's take a moment to, to assess that. For some people, what they believe is they just believe out of ambition. They just, they're kind of ambitious. They hope, I hope it's true. 
Um, uh, say, why, why, do you, why do you believe that? Well, it makes me feel good. Why do you believe Christianity? What you just said, Pastor, that sounded good to me. I hope it's true. Some people believe what they believe out of tradition. They, their parents taught them that, and they, they learned it somewhere else, and their family believed it, and just nobody ever challenged it. Ask somebody, hey, why do you, they, they were going to sell a house, and they buried a statue upside down in their backyard. And I said, why did you bury a statue upside down in your backyard? Some of you right now are like, oh, oh, oh I know, because you grew up in that tradition. I said to this person, why do you bury a statue upside down in your backyard? He said, I don't know, but it sells the house. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Some people believe what they believe out of convenience. It just makes the world a little bit easier to believe that. You get a promotion. It Don't rock the boat. It's what my boss believes. It's what my family believes. It's what other people believe. And the truth is, I don't believe it. It just makes my marriage a little bit easier. I, I don't know if I believe it. It just makes my workplace a little bit easier. I, I don't know if I believe it, but it keeps things right with my mom and dad. And I, I, I get paid. That. It just makes it a little easier. But there's another reason to believe. And it's not just that you hope so. It's not just that you always heard so. It's not just that it makes life easier. But what we look for is what we would call conviction. Conviction is when something inside your soul knows that it is true. That you know that you know that you know that it is real. Listen, in Hebrews 11, 1, remember what it said? <laughs> it, said it said this, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. The gospel, Jesus Christ come, died, buried, rose again to save you. The gospel, the gospel came to you, not simply words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. Listen to those words again. The gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. I, I, I mean, the truth is this. When I describe something as big as what I just did, the stakes are too high to just believe if it's not true. Yeah, well, what, really, I mean, what are the stakes? What, what's really at stake? What's it hurt for me just to believe if it's not true? Well, our, our souls are on the line. And to be blunt, your children's souls are on the line. So you should have, so somebody says to me, hey, David, because then you, kind of, you all get kind of quiet, like sometimes I've got doubts, but I don't want to tell David because he looks pretty sure of himself. But every now and then somebody kind of builds up their courage and they come to me and go, hey, David, so uh, this is awkward, but do you ever doubt? Friend says that. And finally, he builds up enough friendship, goes, do you ever doubt? I said, yeah. I'm the chief of doubters. Really? You doubt? Yeah, you lay a bed at, well, you know, he's young, teenager, in my 20s, later. Lay in bed and think, wait, 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 wait. So I was just born into the right faith? I just happened to be right? I was just that lucky? Well, what if it's not true? But I would also say this, that my doubts cause me to investigate the faith more sincerely. That my doubts are what actually, thank, can I say this? That you may never hear another pastor say this. Thank God for doubt. Because doubt is the thing that stirred a holy curiosity in me. That instead of just accepting tradition, instead of just taking convenience, there was something in me that said, I have to know it's true. And I chased it down. And guys, this is what I found out. Instead, some of you are kind of lazy doubters. You just go around and you're like, I don't know, I got doubts. You saying I got doubts. The entire Christian faith, 2,000 years of history, is going to fall down because you got doubts. What are your doubts? And I took time to define my doubts. Where is it that I've got questions? And I just, I, I, I began to think deeply. This, this is what my doubts did, is they caused me to think more deeply about my faith. They came to Jesus, they said, hey, what is the most important command? Which is a slightly exciting place to be in your Bible. When they ask God on earth, what's the best Bible verse? Remember what Jesus said? He quotes Deuteronomy uh, and he says this. He says, the most important command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. <laughs> it's a big deal when God comes down and goes, I need you guys to think. This is going to be a thinking faith. I can only, I, can I just give you my theological testimony? For me, the doubter, my faith rests on four foundational truths. 
For you, you may land somewhere else as you investigate Christianity, but these four were the most important things to me in placing my faith in Jesus. Number one is archaeology. That I, that the, the places that are talked about are real places. The people talked about are real people. You can go visit these places today. They're not mythical things. This is not a galaxy far, far away. But you can go to Israel. You can go to Egypt. You, you, you can go to Iraq. It's about real people, historically documented. It, it's about King David and King Ahab. We know that, that guy from history. It's about Nebuchadnezzar and Pontius Pilate and Herod. We go look these people up. But not only was there archaeology, for me, it is a big deal when we think about something called, not just creation, but the specific form of creation called creation ex nihilo. Creation ex, ex nihilo is not just to rearrange pre-existing materials. Cre creation ex nihilo is something only God can do. And that, you know, when you cook, you just take already existing materials and you rearrange them. You don't really create the cake. You, am I right? You just, re you just kind of move that. What, what we claim is not that God just took the pre-existing materials and gave order to them, but that God actually breathed into existence the building blocks of the creation that out of nowhere, all, and th does this make sense? All of this had to come from somewhere, and it started out out of nowhere, and there had to be one big enough to breathe it in out of nowhere. Yeah. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the conviction of things not seen, and it says this in Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's creation ex nihilo. I mean, they, just look at this. If it's got designed, it must have a designer. If it has order, somebody must have given an order. You're talking about, a, go, a, there should be something when you look at the stars in 12 Psalms at night, you should look up there and go, who did that? You're talking about a universe so big, we don't measure it in yards or miles, we measure it by light. Amen. Who did that? I don't know about you, I think that's slightly phenomenal, right? You, um, I just learned this, bees, like bu bumble bees. Um, did you know that, that um, they sense a flower's electrical field and that they uh, follow that to find the pollen? Who, who taught them that? Who, who taught birds which way to fly? You don't see lost birds very often. <laughs> you see birds stopping at gas stations asking for, anyway. Taking their cell phones. Every now and then you get one confused bird still out here in 29 Palms going, guys, guys. They're like, we're over here in Disneyland. Anyway, your, your eye can receive 1.5 million messages simultaneously. Who did that? You think that just randomly happened? Or would not just your eye, not to mention your entire body, would not just your eye require a creator? Somebody to do that. Everything about this, we breathe in O2 and we exhale CO2. Plants take CO2 and by a process called photosynthesis, put out O2 that we breathe. Who planted? That's a good idea. Humans never put together a committee that said, hey, we need to figure out the O2, CO2. What if we put plants out there? That, that, well, somebody already, the entire planet is encoded. Every bit of life all around us is encoded with something called DNA. DNA is information. Who put the information there? Information requires one smarter than the information to put it there. To me, just the creation itself, when I look and I see there must be someone that made it. But also for me, it's pretty convincing that there's something called fulfilled prophecy. And that is, fulfilled prophecy is not God taking guesses at the future. It is God telling history before it happens. Um, you can't, by the way, you can't do that. You can't, you can guess but um, the Bible has a 100% track record. So you, some of them in Ezekiel 37, it said that Israel would vanish for a period of time. And it did. There was a time that there were more Jews in New York City than there were in Israel because it was occupied. But then Ezekiel 37 said that Israel in the last days would be restored. In 1948, that was fulfilled when Israel returned as a nation. Perfectly fulfilled by the prophets. The prophet Daniel prophesied the exact day that Jesus would enter Jerusalem. Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in all of Jerusalem 40 years before it happened in a sermon set called the Olivet Discourse. Psalm 78 verse 2 said the Messiah would speak in parables. Question, did he? he Nod your heads, he, he did. <laughs> you know about the parables, right? The lost sheep, the lost son, the... 
Zechariah chapter 9 said that he would come riding in to Jerusalem on a donkey. Did he? I think he did. Psalm 41 verse 9 says that he'd be betrayed by a friend, and indeed he was, Judas Iscariot. Psalm 22 verse 18 says that they would pierce his hands and his feet, that they would cast lots for his clothing. So, well, maybe he just kind of manipulated the, the circumstances. You know, Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says where he would be born. That's kind of hard to manipulate. Hey, mom, why you kind of kick your mom that direction? Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. There's no way to manipulate where you're going to be born. The only way for that to happen is for God to speak history before it happens. I like all of those, but for me, uh, you, you could even take those away. And my faith remains on this bedrock. Here's, here's the theological my house, uh, uh, rock that my house rests on is this. It's not just that there's this archaeology that's out there that's, that's incredible, this incredible creation ex nihilo that I can see the evidence all around me. It's not just the fulfillment of prophecy, but for me, the core of who I am, I believe what I believe because of the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and hey, I'm a preacher. I've done a lot of funerals. The more funerals I do, the more convinced I get that the resurrection is proof that Jesus was God because generally speaking, dead people stay dead. Am I right? Um, death is something humans cannot conquer that only God would be able to conquer. Okay, can I put it this way? I, I don't know if I put this in your notes, but you, you ought to write it down. The resurrection gives me a concrete starting point for faith. It gives me a spot to start out that's concrete, that's, that's tangible, that's historical. It, it, the, the resurrection of Jesus was not a spiritual resurrection. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't a dream. He actually bodily rose from the dead. And something tangible happened. Come and touch, feel. Something happened in reality, something that was physical. Theologian Gary Habermas said it this way. I love, I, I love this. He's, he said, the resurrection is a rock that can bear the weight of Christianity. Is that good? The resurrection is a rock. The wise man built his house on a rock. I want faith that is concrete. The resurrection is a rock that can bear the weight of Christianity. Does this make sense? Say, hey, do you believe the Bible? Yes. Have you gone out of your way? If you're going to believe the Bible, have you gone out of your way to prove every story? Have you gone out of your way to find evidence for each of the stories? No. I accept the Bible based on faith, but not on blind faith. I start here. If God can raise the dead, then flooding the world's not a problem for him. I just, listen, faith doesn't have to be blind. It just has to have a starting place. Once you have a starting place that's concrete, then you can step out to the next thing. Did that make sense? So I don't have to prove every, everything. Hey, church, God only has to prove himself once. And once you know God's God, anything's possible. So I don't stress about the rest of it. Because God gave me a concrete starting point. Do I believe God parted the sea? Yeah. Did I go out to the sea and investigate? And I, hey, there's chariot wheels. Anyway, did I go investigate? No. Because my conviction is, is that if God can raise the dead, that he's not up there stressed about how to part a sea. He's not worried about how to flood a world. Send down fire on Mount Carmel. Do you believe that? Yeah. Because if God can raise the dead, he's not up there going, can I make fire? Can I do it? Can I do it? Listen, if you've got a God big enough to raise the dead and get out of a problem no other human can get out of, then there was one bigger than we humans who's over humanity, and that's Jesus Christ. In him I trust. Or if I can put it this way, God proved himself capable of the entire Bible when he raised Jesus from the dead. Every story in the Bible is validated by the one account Proven at the resurrection. You go, wait, wait, wait. This is a good question. How, how do you know he rose from the dead? Uh, you hear so much evidence. Women found the tomb, and in their day, they, they would have said that it was men who found the tomb if they, were, if they were lying. Just the very fact that the tomb was empty. Give evidence. But for me, it just because my theological testimony no, what's most convincing to me about the resurrection of Jesus is the apostles' suffering. That the apostles were in a place to know whether or not they were telling a lie, and yet they came forward and they said, we absolutely believe that Jesus rose again, and we will suffer for that. Because 
Here's a kind of a basic truth of humanity. You tell me if it's true or not. Uh, this is the truth. Humans don't like to suffer. Am I right? Or some of you like, actually, a little bit of pain is good. Listen, you guys can't handle goat heads and 29 palms. Oh, oh, oh. Your kid leaves a Lego out, you think you're going to die, which you might. We're not talking little thorns and we're not talking Legos. We're talking men that were taken and beat for their faith. And they suffered. Acts chapter 5, it says they took them, they whipped them. And it says they left that place. How would you leave if somebody beat you for your faith? It says they left rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Who does that? Only people who are absolutely convinced and they know the truth. They are absolutely sure of what they saw. They didn't get rich saying that he rose from the dead. They died. It's just so, I, I just started writing down. How, I looked into it like, how did these guys die? I started writing it down. And tell me, Matthew was killed by the sword in Ethiopia. James was thrown from the temple a hundred feet, probably one of the same places Jesus was, was tempted to throw himself down. James was, was pushed over the temple, thrown down a hundred feet. When they found him alive, they beat him with a fuller's club until he was dead. All the time saying, Jesus, Jesus rose, Jesus rose, Jesus rose. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded by King Herod. Nathaniel was flayed to death by a whip. Andrew was crucified but did not die immediately. He hung on a cross for two days and preached to his tormentors. At no point did he say, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. But that's not the most convincing evidence to me. Bartholomew was crucified. Philip was crucified. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Thomas, who said, I won't believe unless I touch his hands and feel his feet. Thomas was stabbed to death with a spear in India saying, I believe. I saw the risen Lord. Jude was killed with arrows. Matthias was stoned and then he was beheaded. Luke, who wrote the gospel, was hanged for, for, for his faith. John Mark was dragged by a horse through the streets of Alexandria until he died. And the Apostle Paul. You know what history tells us about the Apostle Paul who saw Jesus on that Damascus road, once doubted and now believed? Josephus says that when they took the Apostle Paul under order of Emperor Nero to execute him, probably died the same year that the Apostle Peter did. That they led him to the place to execute him, and there was a moment that he broke three of his captors. But instead of running away, he ran to the chopping block and laid down his head because he could not wait to run into the presence of Jesus. Who does that? Only people absolutely convinced of the truth of what they believe. But none of that's the most convincing to me. It's when you get to Peter that things are incredible. Clement tells us, say, what happened to Peter? Clement tells us that they took Peter to execute him and that they would execute him on an X-shaped cross. But when they went to lay him out to execute him, isn't that the moment you go, wait, 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 wait. Before you drive nails in my feet and, and in my hands, turns out we only slightly saw him risen. That's the point where you change your story. Is it the point where you go, wait, wait, never mind. Sorry. But Peter, about to be executed, begged that he be executed in a way different than Jesus because he was not worthy to die as Jesus had died. So they crucified him upside down. That's not the most convincing evidence. It's this. The day that Peter died, before he died, he watched his wife executed. Isn't that the point that you go? <laughs> no. What do you do if they're going to kill your wife? It's one thing if they drive nails in your hands and your feet. You might take it for a lie. Maybe. But would you let your wife? Clinton says that they brought her up to execute her, and Peter saw her. He says he called to her warmly. 
by name. And then he said this, because this is the moment. If you're a liar, this is the moment that you go, wait, don't kill her. I love her so much. And he called to her, remember the Lord and watch her executed. To me, that's pretty convincing. Peter's testimony was this in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Peter said, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs. You saw it. He fed the multitudes. He healed people. He drove out demons. He walked on water. He calmed the storm. He raised the dead. Then Peter says this. This is the testimony of a man who would give his life for the faith. He was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I love that picture. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Like the arms of death reach out and they grab Jesus and he just goes, bam, 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 and walks out of the tomb. Verse 32 says, Peter said, God raised Jesus to life and we are witnesses of that fact. Why do you believe? Why do you believe all of the Bible? Because I started somewhere concrete. There was a factual thing that happened in history. It was observable. It was witnessed. It was concrete. And based on that concrete thing, I believe all of the rest. Well, hey, Peter, could we, could we change your, your mind? Hey, Peter, what if we throw you in prison? It won't change. I saw what I saw. It was a fact. Well, what if we beat you? It didn't change the fact that the tomb was empty. You can beat me. But the tomb was still empty. Well, what if we crucify you? Then I will go to my death declaring that he lives. What if we kill your wife? Nothing you do to me will change the fact that Jesus Christ rose again. That's pretty concrete. That's pretty strong. Pastor, question. Is it foolish to believe? Well, it's foolish to believe if you're just guessing. Amen? Because the Bible never called you to make a wild guess, throw your hat in a, in, out somewhere, and some of you are just believing multiple things because you don't know what you believe, so just believe all of it. It's all good. What do you believe? I believe in what I believe. What do you believe? I believe in faith. What faith? I just believe. What? I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and that he rose again. And because again, he saved me from my sins and that he's coming again. But here's what godly faith does. Godly faith looks for the evidence and then it steps out. And some of you need to take a next step of faith because you've been waiting. You've been lingering for too long in the shadows of doubt. I just ask you, we're going to just give you an invitation here in a moment, but what's stopping you from taking the next step of faith? I mean, maybe it's been a while since you really thought deeply about spiritual things. You're just kind of faith is, is faith. And it's been a while since you fed your soul and your soul is starving. Hey, guys, video games can't, can't feed your soul. Amen. Ladies, never mind. <laughs> Some of you, it's time that you thought more deeply about spiritual things. Some of you need to take the next step of faith. Not just to pray a quick prayer to get saved, but to entrust your very soul and being to Jesus Christ. And it's time that you did that, that you got really clear about Jesus. Jesus did not call you to just a prosperity gospel. He called you to take up your cross and follow him. And we join throngs of believers in the past who stood for their faith to their very death. And in this generation, we will preach with joy Jesus Christ. And we will be willing as a people to suffer for him because it's true. Because it's true. Some of you, the step of faith you need to take is to be baptized. Weren't the baptisms awesome? Amen. To stand for his name. Others of you need to, need to trust him with a heartache. And some of you today need to ask Jesus to restore to you the joy of your salvation. Remember those villagers? 
when the screen came on and suddenly Jesus had risen from the dead and they were dancing with joy. Do you know why you do that? Because something in your heart knows that it's true. And when all the faith is sure, suddenly there's joy in your heart, no matter what's going on in the world around you. And some of you need to just pray, God, would you restore to me the joy of my selfishness? I don't know what God's doing in your heart right now, but I do want to do this. I want to give you a clear time to make a decision for Jesus. Some of you need to clearly repent of sin. Some of you may need to be carrying burdens and you need to lay them down before God at this altar. Others of you need to rededicate your life. I don't know all the maybes because the Holy Spirit's got more maybes he's dealing with you than I've got time. But there is an altar here. And I just want to give you time at this altar. And I would love to pray with you. Ryan's over here. He'd love to pray with you. Grover and Melinda would love to pray with you. Or you can just skip us and come right to the altar. But you make this your time with God. Would you stand? Thank you for listening to the sermon. For further information or to get in contact with our church's ministries, please visit us at palmasbaptistchurch.com.